Hi there, welcome to the Shetland Times podcast. I am your host today, Thor Holt, and I'm looking forward to introducing you to today's guest. First of all, please do feel free to go to iTunes and leave the Shetland Times podcast a review because it makes a big difference to people considering listening to the show. So if you've enjoyed anything we've done, we'd hugely appreciate a review, even if it's not a five-star review. Still great to hear what you think. Also, do get in touch at theshetlandtimes.co.uk and let us know who you'd like to hear interviewed on the show. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Andrew Harmsworth. Andrew, how are you doing? Lord, I'm okay. I'm all set, I think. <laughs> Good man. Well, why don't we kick off by you telling me a story, despite having known you for years, I've never heard, and that is, how did you end up in Shetland, Andrew? Right, okay, here we go then. Well, my old family home's in Caithness, and uh, when I left school, I joined the army, and I went to uh, Sandhurst for two years training, and then I joined the Seaforth Highlanders, and we were then amalgamated with the Cameron Highlanders to become the Queen's Own Highlanders, and we were sent out to Singapore. That was in 1961. And when we got to Singapore, um, it was a red light area. No one knew anything about me. Parents weren't around. I really started uh, indulging myself in all sorts of unhelpful ways. Um, And then I got posted to the Jungle Warfare School as an instructor. And while I was there, I contracted a rather unsociable disease. And that really brought me up in my track and I decided to turn to Jesus Christ and say, right, Lord, from now on, you're my commanding officer, and I've been following you ever since. Now, when I then came back um, to this country, but then I'd met um, my wife, Sarah, out in Singapore. She worked with the political advisor's office, uh, which is part of the foreign office, and we got engaged and got married in 1967, so it's our 50th wedding anniversary this year. Congratulations. Um, Thank you very much. (laughs) And uh, then I went back for a second tour. We went back for a second tour in Malaysia, and that was ended in 1968. Um, Now, in 1968, I decided that I wanted to leave the army. I liked the army, but I wanted to learn a new career. And so I retired from the army. I was in Sharjah in the Persian Gulf at the time when that happened. And I went to Sour and Sester, the Royal Agricultural College in Gloucestershire, to learn to be an agricultural surveyor. So I did that for three years, got a diploma, worked for an agricultural surveyor in the area for two years, and then I qualified uh, after that. Now, do you want to go on? Um, that's probably got you a bit of the way anyway. That's and, great. Oh, I, I haven't got to Shetland yet, have I? No, no but hold not. on, hold Sorry. on. Before, before we get to Shetland, wait, wait. <laughs> I just want to clarify, I heard you right. Did you say that you ended up in a red light district? What, the army stationed you in a red light district? That was a red rag to a bull, well, wasn't it? Well, Singapore was <laughs> one of the major red light areas in the world, you know. We were in Singapore, um, which was a, you know, this was going back in the 60s, but it was quite a swinging city, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> like Scalawa <but>, then. <laughs> <laughs> very like, no, not quite. Similarities, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, what happened after um, becoming an agricultural surveyor I uh, worked for two years with a firm in Gloucestershire, and then that job came to an end, and Sarah and myself were both Christians by then, so we thought it would be a cool idea to ask God what he wanted to do with us, did he want us to go to darkest Africa or whatever, and we gave him a deadline by the 20th of August that year, and we would take any job or anything that was going. So when that deadline came, the only job going, hadn't even been interviewed for it, was working for the Department of Agriculture in Scotland. And so I went up to the interview in Edinburgh, uh, was accepted, 
and they posted us to Dundee for nine months to learn how a major office worked. That was from September 74 right through to May 75. And then uh, they posted us to Shetland. And we knew, because we'd asked the Lord about it, that this was the right place to go. And so in May uh, 75, I arrived in Shetland. Uh, there was no accommodation, so it was just myself. Stayed in a and b which was actually um, part of uh, the big house oh, in Lerwick. And I can't remember its name. That's awful. On the far side of the Crickermin Loch, there's a big old house there. But that's where I stayed in a B&B mm -hmm. um, until Sarah and the children came up in July that year. Mm -hmm. Now, we had actually asked the Lord to show us what house we're going to be living in. And the house we're actually in now came up in the paper um, before we actually got to Shetland. Andrew, I'm... And we put it... Hold on, I'm surprised Sorry. you still. I'm surprised you trusted the the word of God after He sent you to Dundee. That was a bit of a tough call, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I liked it. I liked Dundee. <laughs> um, I quite enjoyed Dundee, and we lived in a in Fife, in actual fact, a lovely place called Bleber Craigs in a rented cottage, mm -hmm. and I commuted into Dundee every day. So it was a no, it was a lovely place, quite near St Andrews, a great place. But anyway, um, we ha we were shown this was going to be the house we're going to be in, um, and we put a bid in for it. But sadly, the very week we put the bid in for it, uh, Tommy Manson, the older brother of the family, died, and so the family took the house off the market. Mm -hmm. And so we really had to wait for a year until the house came back on the market. And during that time, we lived in a beach hut down at Gulbwick owned by Peter Black. That was our first winter in Shetland, from about September through till May, and there were a lot of southeasterly gales, but it was great. <laughs> it was a tiny wee place, had a wood-burning stove and a kitchen that was about 15 feet long and three foot wide, with a basin mm -hmm. at one end and a cooker at the other. What year was and that, we then? we lived that, and down on the shore at Gulfwick. Hi, what year was that, though, sorry? Oh, that was 75. Um, Okay. Yeah, 75, 76. And then the house we're in now came up on the market. We put the bid in we'd put in the year before and got the house, which we're very pleased with in Westerclough. Um, lovely place and very fine people round about. When I came up, I joined the Department of Agriculture as Assistant Lands Officer, very smart-sounding name. Jack Burgess was the Senior Lands Officer. Um, and Jack was a great guy to work for. And he left after three months to go and join the council as development, uh, of, you know, development manager. Mm -hmm. And that left me in charge, which is quite interesting, because I was a bit of a, a rookie. <laughs> uh, if I did something well, everyone thought that was amazing. If I did it badly, they thought, oh, well, he doesn't know the score anyway. So quite a good position to be in. <laughs> Plus, they gave you more money. Uh, <laughs> uh, Right, now from 75 to 80, I worked in the Department of Agriculture as Assistant Lands Officer, which was a great job because it meant that you travelled all over Shetland. And it also, in those days, um, most of the decisions were delegated to the local office, which was a very good idea because we understood what was going on and we could make sensible decisions. I think nowadays, sadly, it's um, become much more centralised. Can you, would you be able to, sorry, before you go on with the story, I'd love to know how you found it, and you can be honest here because it was a while ago, how did you find it being a Suthmutha arriving in Shetland back in the mid-70s? Because I, obviously you know my parents, and I had a bit of an interesting experience at school at least, even though I was born and brought up in Shetland, of being, uh, how can I say, not everyone, but some people certainly treated Suthmuthas in a less than respectful way, we could say. So how did yeah. you find it turning up and obviously going out into Crofts with proper Shetlanders? As well, I found, I found that Shetlanders, if you weren't a Shetlander, well, that was obvious, mm -hmm. um, but they then more or less treated you as they found you. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I thought, a very healthy sort of relationship. But it was rather good being in a sort of 
uh, official position in a way, because when you went to see a croft or speak to a crofter, um, they they could tell you things that perhaps they wouldn't have told their own their next door neighbour, mm-hmm. because they knew that you weren't in the in the sort of um, in the jungle vine, you know. Mm-hmm. So messages wouldn't get back, and uh, I found people were very open and very receptive. But having said that, I think our children had a much harder time. Um, I mean, in the local school, um, our daughter was the only one who wasn't a Shetlander. Mm-hmm. Um, I think she probably enjoyed the school quite a lot, but it wasn't easy for the children. It was much easier for me, I think, and Sarah. Mm-hmm. But I've always found Shetlanders to be very uh, accepting. They, they, once you've established that you're not a Shetlander, which in my case is very easy <laughs> to establish, um, then they are very friendly and take you as you are, which I think is a very healthy, healthy um, aspect of life here, really. Absolutely. I guess the thing about kids as well is that kids are always going to find something to rip the, how can we put it politely, rip the pee out of each other for. So oh. uh, those of us that were considered English or Suthmuthas at school probably were going to be in for it. Just that happened absolutely. to be the thing they chose. But yeah, it would have been, would have been something no, a- else, wasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, completely right. I mean, ch- children will latch on to anything that's different. Um and of course, that that applies to to their own fellow pupils. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, shall I go on? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I was agricultural. Uh, I was in the department up until 1980, and then the council advertised for an agricultural development officer. The idea was by using um, oil money. Um, the local authority could actually assist local industries, which is an excellent idea. Uh, So I was given the task, I was appointed as agricultural development officer, given the task of formulating an agricultural policy for Shetland uh, Islands Council, and that was drawn up with Stuart Mitchell Hill of the Shetland, of the Scottish, sorry, Agricultural College. And we had a budget of about 500,000 and we had some very good schemes, I think. One was a bull purchase scheme, which meant that we paid 50% of the cost of buying a pedigree bull and bringing it up to Shetland, which definitely improved the quality of the livestock. There were lime and fertilizer grants, taking into account the extra freight that uh, crofters and farmers have to pay. And there was an agricultural loan scheme, which uh, gave pretty favorable rate loans with nothing to pay for the first two years on development so that crofters and farmers could proceed with a development straight away rather than waiting till they'd hopefully saved up money for it. There were many other schemes, a whole lot of them, but it was very good and sad to say uh, that was all withdrawn, not during my time, but later on because of the state aids rule from the European Union. There's a thought that maybe that would be able to come back once we have left the European Union. Mm-hmm. Just, a, I had a question, actually, Andrew. On you've you've been in Shetland a, a long time. I mean, since the mid seventies. And although you you say you're out of the game, you are still working, and you probably still have your finger on the pulse to some degree. I wonder, what would you say have been the major changes in the agricultural scene in Shetland over the years? Well, that's a tall order. I suppose um, that crofts tend to be worked in multiples nowadays, mm-hmm. um, whereas before. You had one family with a croft. Um, the number of um, new crofters coming on the scene has, has decreased, and therefore you tend to get uh, one person working several crofts. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, just a, a, a sort of sheer economics that um, to get you know the maximisation is to to work with a bigger area. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that that I think is one quite one big thing um but i don't know that i i wouldn't say i've got my pass on it that much i would say that there's still a a great interest in crofting and farming and encouraging to see some some young ones coming forward and of course the government do have a scheme whereby young crofters and that's anyone under the age of 40 more or less um get enhanced enhanced grants and i think Mm -hmm. that's a very very good idea um, I think crofting is fairly healthy in Shetland. It has its ups and downs, but 
I think it's a great industry and a great lifestyle as well. And long may it continue. Yeah, I agree. So uh, you, you said you don't think you have the finger on the pulse uh, as much. Uh, one thing I think you do keep your finger on the pulse of is politics. Uh, can you relay to me the story you told me about being at the the outing debate? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Well, it wasn't a very minor thing, really, but there was an outing debate um, just before. Goodness, I can't remember which election it was now, but um, the, I think the Liberal Democrat candidate had not managed to turn up here. I think he was ill at the time, actually. I think it was a pretty genuine excuse. Uh, the Conservative one could not make it either, so I think it was just SNP and the Labour. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were saying rather similar things, and I stood up and made a point um, from a rather conservative point of view. And I was described uh, in the paper as the the only conservative in the village, actually <laughs> referring to the only gay in the village <laughs> program that was on at the time. <laughs> that was quite amusing. That's <laughs> fun. What was that? Can you remember the point you made? And by the way, what, what newspaper? You, you, you're allowed to name them as it's the Shetland Times podcast. Can you just clarify for me which newspaper no, you was, mentioned? It was the Shetland Times, yes. It was the Shetland Times. It was quite amusing. Thank I goodness thought. for that. It was very good. <laughs> I had no problems with that whatsoever. Um, <laughs> I can't even remember the point I made, but it was obviously um, at variance with the ones from the, the SNP and Labour candidates. Anyway, would you, would you say you are pretty much the only Conservative in Charlotte? <laughs> well, I don't know. You see, it's it's interesting because um, there may be people who don't dare say they're a Conservative, <laughs> but uh, obviously, in the last election, the Conservatives did reasonably well, and now the official opposition in Scotland. Um, I actually, t- I, I like getting on with with um, people of every sort of party. It doesn't bother me too much. In fact, some of the nicest people are SNP. Um, and so I, I really, I, I just take it with a bit of pinch of the salt, but I'm definitely a conservative. Mm-hmm. I have to confess to that. Well done, you've confessed, um, and now it'll go out on the podcast. I'm not editing that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so where did we get to? We were in nowadays, the 80s. I we, think, go, on, go on, sorry, Andrew, nowadays, carry on. I, nowadays, I think it's very difficult to ascertain what people really think because there are certain subjects that um, if you actually stated your view, you would be absolutely slated. Mm-hmm. But perhaps that point of view is held by a lot more people than we realise. Yeah. It's, it's how many people are actually prepared to <laughs> stand up and say um, the thing that is... Uh, politically incorrect <laughs> it's, the, it's the social pressures you talked about you were talking earlier about the when you would go and visit crofters and they would of course realize that you weren't kind of in the local loop so they would maybe confess things to you that they wouldn't to others can you can you remember that sort of reminded me of that the political thing would, can you actually remember anything that people would confess to you can you give me an example if you can't oh remember don't goodness. worry no, I, I can't really, but people were, were pretty open, I think, you know. Um, yeah, they were pretty open mm-hmm. and uh, very friendly. I enjoyed going to visit Crofts. The main problem was you always got a couple of a cup of coffee or tea and a ra- large assortment of biscuits and cakes and things, <laughs> and it was keeping the weight down. It was one of the problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you're, a, you're quite a man for marching over the hills, aren't you? Didn't you had a dog? At oh the yeah, time, I do. I, I I go out for a walk every day, regardless of weather. Um, not that I'd say I was very fit, but um, I, I, I'm keeping going. Put it that way. What was your dog what, called in those days? Was it was sorry, it Shocker? Oh, what, what was the do- your dog? Shocker was it? What was the dog? Shocker, Shocker, which is the caseless word for a peewit. <laughs> um, and. <laughs> Chocolate was a Gordon setter, and uh, we had her till she was 15, I think. Yeah. And then later on, we got an English uh, English Springer. Um, so we, we like dogs, I must say. And uh, the trouble is, if you're going away a lot, you've got to have somebody who's going to look after your dog when you're away. And we don't know anyone like that at the moment. <laughs> um, one incident, I don't know if, this, if it's worth mentioning, was the Breer, mm, which was yeah. probably one of the major things that happened when I was... Agricultural Development Officer. It was on the 5th of January, 1993, uh, when the Brer oil tanker um, 
which was carrying, I think it was 87,000 tons mm -hmm. of uh, Norwegian crude oil, uh, was wrecked um, in the south of Shetland at Garth's Nest. And, of course, it was an absolute major crisis. Uh, we heard about it in the early hours of the morning. Mm -hmm. And we did get all the Christians we know praying about it. And uh, it was billed to be the worst oil disaster ever in the world. And I think there were five television crews from Japan over. The place was actually swarming with press. Um, but the prayers were answered because Jonathan Wills um, on Grampian Television um, in 1994, said, I'm not a churchgoer, but many Christians in Shetland of all denominations started holding prayer meetings to pray that it would go away. I have to admit, I was a bit scornful of the idea, but if that didn't work, something did. And he goes on to say the incredible win for two weeks of up to 120 miles an hour, and how the wind and the tides just churned up the oil. Uh, rather like um, uh, putting a, a drop of uh, mayonnaise in a bath, and uh, it just disappeared, basically. Um, what about on the land, not, though? What, what about on the land, Andrew? Was it, I mean, well, it, it went, this was the bit where I came in, you know, I had an interest, obviously, because mm -hmm. it was light crude oil. It sprayed onto the land, and the great thing was that the crofters should have put their which should put their sheep in a really small corral and feed them on hay. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, there wasn't that amount of hay around anyway. And if they did that, all would be well. So I went down to the sort of mission control, which was down at Sumbra, and I wanted to ask, can you please say that the council will pay for all reasonable food and everything they need to keep the sheep going over mm -hmm. this period? And um, they were so busy, I think, about other things that I think that I just got the message, yes, go go ahead, you know, get on with it, <laughs> and, which was brilliant because we were able to say to the crofters and farmers, yes, the council will pay. Mm -hmm. And we obviously had to administer it, and the hay was delivered, sheep were corralled and fed, and at the end of the day, the insurance paid up anyway, so it didn't actually, in the end, cost the, gut, the council anything at all um, but it did mean that the sheep were looked after and the oil obviously spread on the ground but after about six weeks um, really there was little effect to be honest mm -hmm. um, and one remark one or two remarks were the banks floors had never looked so bonny the following summer <laughs> because oil of course is in the right measure a sort of fertilizer and so that that prayer was quite a big incident in, in, over the years. And um, so in 1999, I went to Argentina on a Christian Harvest Time conference with uh, Andrew Holtbrook and a couple of others, including my sister. Mm -hmm. And it really blew me away. It was just amazing what was happening in Argentina, a major revival. And so I felt God saying to me, right, I want more of your time. So I decided to put in my retiral, mm -hmm. and I did actually retire from the full-time job as agricultural development a year later, but I was allowed to carry on doing the management of the Booster and Barrio Estate as self-employed, but just doing the work a couple of days a week, which seemed to have worked out quite well. And then... October last year, the council decided that the contract after 15 and a half years um, had come to an end. And so I then had about a month off. And then since November 2016, I've been doing the same self-employed croft work with Tate and Peterson. Mm -hmm. And Tate and Peterson actually handle about at least 20 of the estates in Shetland. And so, I so I've been working away doing that. Sorry, Andrew, I had a question. Uh, just you, You're obviously a, a believer in, in God and a, a committed churchgoer and have been since your fairly early days, as you told me. But how do you see the future of... So, so I remember as a kid going along to the local church of Scotland on Papa Stewart and 
I don't know. It's it's not the most exciting place, I guess, but there's something. <laughs> well, I know, but there's something about it, a bit like the crofting lifestyle. There is something about it that's kind of feels like it's in the yeah. in the bones of Shetland to me. And so I I just wondered how you feel that side yeah. of things is going. The more traditional Christianity. Do you keep in touch with the Church of Scotland and and what's the kind of attendance like? Because you say there are more young people coming into crofting. Are there any young people going to the Church of Scotland these days? Well, I don't know about the Church of Scotland. You see, and. I would say my view is, in spite of all the different denominations, there is really only one church. And if uh, Christians are actually all of the same family. And so my vision, if you like, is to see the the Christians in Shetland working together in harmony. Uh, You said I'm I'm not a committed churchgoer, I'm a committed Christian. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're seeing nowadays is that there's much more um, contact and and interrelationship between Christians of all different denominations. And mm-hmm. I think that is a very healthy sign. And I think that's what will actually attract people um, rather than the traditional um, church buildings and everything else. And nothing wrong with them in a sense, but... Um, it, church has got to be more than just going to a building. It's mm-hmm. got to be a lifestyle. It's got to be a relationship with God and with others, basically. Thank you. So you, uh, just, you, so talked, about, you, you talked about um, lifestyle there. You just mentioned it as in Christianity being a lifestyle. But you and Sarah, obviously, you've been in Shetland for quite a while now. Could you ever imagine yourselves moving away, like going back to the north of Scotland, to your to your roots because, I mean, a lot of Shetlanders go away for a while and then come back to their roots in Shetland. Yeah. Can you ever yeah. imagine retiring down south, even just to Scotland? No, I can't imagine it. I mean, I hope that if God said go to some other place, I would be obedient and go. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't want to, uh, mm-hmm. because I believe sincerely that where you are is home. Mm-hmm. I've never looked over my shoulder thinking, well, I really ought to be somewhere else, you know. Uh, to me, Shetland is home. If God moves me somewhere else, that would be home. Mm-hmm. But uh, if I've got any roots, they're definitely here. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's encouraging to hear. And I've got a, a question I like to chuck at everybody yeah. towards the end of our time speaking, and that is, what advice would you give to somebody who is considering either just a visit or more likely if someone was telling you that they were considering moving to Shetland, what advice would you give them? I think my advice would be come in at a low level. I think Shetlanders, and probably others as well, um, appreciate if you come into a place and you ask them for help and advice, Mm -hmm. rather than coming in thinking you know it all, because you certainly don't. And uh, fortunately, I'm extremely incompetent at practical things, (laughs) and I'm surrounded by wonderful Shetlanders who are absolutely brilliant at practical things. (laughs) So... My advice would be come in at a low level and make friends and don't try and pretend you know the stuff because you don't. That's brilliant. That's good good life advice. Never mind just for moving to Shetland, but that's I've never heard someone <laughs> No, I've never heard that's the I mean every piece of advice I've had from people over all the episodes I've done. I've done maybe 24 episodes now and that's the first time someone said that. I love that. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you for your time and your energy and enthusiasm, as always. And thanks for coming on the <laughs> Shetland Times podcast. <laughs> Appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Hope you enjoyed that conversation with Andrew Harmsworth. And before I say goodbye, it would be great if you would visit iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast and leave us a review because we'd love to know whether you enjoy it. Or don't. Also, feel free, of course, to write a letter in to the Shetland Times and express your views on the podcast. That's good to hear, whether it's positive or negative. Just keen to hear what you really think. Thanks very much. It's been an honour and a lot of fun being your host on the podcast for the last few months. And I hope you enjoy Mario Lane in the future. All the best. <laughs>